start with our top story. The U.S.-Africa summit begins in Washington, D.C. today with President Joe Biden's administration promising it will kickstart a new era in America's partnership with the continent. They say Africa, with the world's youngest population, biggest free trade area, and large vote in the United Nations, is set to shape the future. But ahead of the event, U.S. officials also voiced concern about instability in parts of Africa. Darren Taylor reports. The governments of Burkina Faso, Guinea, Mali and Sudan won't be at the summit. Out of respect for the African Union, we did not invite governments that have been offended by the African Union for coups. Mali is Assistant Secretary of State for African Affairs. We've taken some criticism, I think it's fair to say, from some who wonder why we invited this government or that government about which there are some concerns. But that reflects the commitment of President Biden and Secretary Blinken to having respectful conversations, even where there are areas of uh, difference. We think actually engaging and consulting and talking about our different perspectives, seeking to advance U.S. values is an appropriate way to meet challenges that we face in common. National Security Council Senior Director for African Affairs, Jad Mumat, recently told reporters the Biden administration's concerned about democratic backsliding in West Africa. If we are going to return to durable civilian-led transition, it's going to take a lot of investment on our part in partnership with regional bodies like ECOWAS and the African Union, with civil society. So at the summit, we are going to talk about the ways in which we can do more to make sure that countries are, are democratic. And we know that the demand for democracy in Africa is high, perhaps higher than any other region, nearly 70 percent. Fee emphasized the U.S. would define its relationship with Africa on African terms with sensitivity to the ravages of colonialism. We're engaged in Africa for our mutual benefit and to advance our mutual interests. It should not be a battlefield for external powers. We understand the damaging impact that history has had, and we want to make sure that the way we approach our work is with respect and prioritization of African thinking. She said the Biden administration would demonstrate this during talks at the summit about the future of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, AGOA. We regret that AGOA trade preferences have not been utilized to the maximum. We think it's important to improve our trade with Africa. We'll also need to consider whether or not that program is continued. Is it continued in its current form? Are there ways that we can use AGOA to support the development of the free trade area, which holds so much promise for the continent? Fee said a major focus of the summit would be to ensure Africa's growing importance is reflected in what she termed international architecture. So I expect there to be an advance on the conversation initiated by President Biden in New York at the United Nations in September when he talked about the importance of having an African seat on the Security Council. The list of areas of exploration at the summit is long from peace and governance to food security to impacts of climate change to trade. But what's really on the agenda is an all-out effort by Washington to demonstrate its desire to be Africa's ideal partner. For VOA News, I'm Darren Taylor in Johannesburg. Zimbabwe, which has been making efforts to re-engage with Western countries, will be represented at the U.S.-Africa Summit but not by President Emerson Manangagwa. He's among those targeted by sanctions that the country has been fighting. Reporter Kuzai Zanawashi looks at the situation. Nangagwa welcomed the invite to the summit in his State of the Nation address in November. Christopher Mutswangwa, spokesperson of the ruling ZANOPF, said Foreign Affairs Minister Frederick Shava is heading Zimbabwe's delegation. Our main focus is on the economic recovery of Zimbabwe. We will be looking at how we can grow the portfolio of American investments in Zimbabwe, how we can improve on our attractiveness to American business interests. Rashid Mukundu is a political analyst. He says Zimbabwe attending the summit is progressive. 
It's a huge step forward for Zimbabwe and USA relations that is resolving the differences between Zimbabwe and the USA, which has led to the imposition of sanctions on some officials that are in the government and also in ZANU-PF. Zimbabwe has been aggressively vocal in calling for the removal of sanctions by the US and other Western countries, which were extended yesterday to Mnangagwa San and three others for alleged corruption. However, the country's delegation is going to the summit with a watered down tone on sanctions. Naturally, one of the impediments which lies in this uh, endeavor is the fact that we are under U.S. Uh, sanctions since 2002. One of the longest running regime of sanctions against any country. We, we say that they are illegal. We say that they should be removed in totality. But in this instance, our main focus is not political, but on the on economic cooperation. America is the superpower of the world, which is the world's largest economy. And any good relations between Zimbabwe and America will be good, will be beneficial to both countries, but principally to Zimbabwe. Mukundu says this is a platform for both Zimbabwe and U.S. to commit to a way forward on ending the sanctions. What um, uh, the Zimbabwean government can do is to use this opportunity to lay out a plan for the resolution of these differences, which uh, means uh, the Zimbabwean government has to make commitments to reforms, especially governance reforms, that meet the expectations of the international community, especially the conduct of uh, free and fair elections, as well as uh, respect for human rights. Uh, And thereafter, uh, of course, uh, there is an expectation that the American government should also make a commitment to uh, how it will respond uh, to the efforts by the Zimbabwean government. Zimbabwe is mineral rich, including deposits of lithium that are in global demand. Something that experts feel may make Zimbabwe attractive at the summit. On the downside, the country's long history of human rights violations abuse of public funds, and widespread corruption worry potential investors. The U.S. maintains it is a friend of the people of Zimbabwe and remains one of their biggest supporters with millions of dollars in aid. For VOA, this is Kudzai Jinawashe from Harare. The UN says famine has been avoided in Somalia for now, but warned that situation still is growing more dire, increasing the need for sustained funding for food relief. The spokesman for the UN's humanitarian relief agency, OCHA, James Larkey, says famine is expected between April and June in the southern part of the country. The French news agency AFP notes that millions of people are at risk of starvation across the Horn of Africa, which is experiencing the failure of the fifth consecutive rainy season, wiping out crops and livestock. Nearly 3 million people in Somalia are expected to experience major food shortages, acute malnutrition, and excess mortality. You're listening to African News Tonight on The Voice of America. I'm Yehayis Wuhib in Washington. The Ugandan army says its troops have killed 11 members of the Allied Democratic Forces, or ADF, when the rebels tried to enter Uganda from the Democratic Republic of Congo. The army says another eight ADF fighters were captured along with their weapons. Halima Tumani reports from Kampala, Uganda. The Ugandan army says about 30 members of the rebel ADF entered Uganda Monday night through the western town of Ntoroko along the Seniliki River. Kano Dewa Kiki, the Uganda People's Defense Forces deputy spokesperson, tells VOA they had been monitoring attempts by the ADF to re-enter Uganda. Several ADF fighters remain on the loose, he says. And the fight is still on to pick one by one until the whole of this group that passed the border into the Samalik area is completely destroyed. In November 2021, the Ugandan army sent troops to the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo in a joint offensive with the Congolese army against the ADF rebels. Kanwa Kiki believes the ADF's motivation for Mandi's incursion was to show they are still active and to carry out reprisal attacks on civilians. We don't only go to DRC to fight them, but we also 
protect our frontiers. And that's how they were intercepted. They thought probably we don't have enough troops on the borders. And that was a miscalculation, and indeed they will regret it. To mark the one-year anniversary of the operation in November, the armies of Uganda and DR Congo extended Operation Shuja, loosely translated as Operation of the Brave, for another year. The Allied Democratic Forces launched its first attack against the Ugandan government in 1995 and has operated for years along border areas of Uganda and eastern Congo. Since it was founded, the group is reported to have killed more than 700 civilians and has battled with a UN peacekeeping mission in Congo, MONUSCO. Halima Athmani for VA News, Kampala, Uganda. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, the police chief in the capital, Kinshasa, says heavy rains and flooding have killed at least 50 people and caused landslides. Reuters says the prime minister and provincial governor are visiting stricken areas and local officials are meeting with the interior ministry and other state bodies to discuss relief. Flash floods have become more frequent with climate change and have often caused large-scale transport disruptions in Kinshasa and other cities with rapid but poorly regulated urbanization. Police officials in southeast Nigeria say operatives killed three armed men yesterday when a gang attacked the office of the Independent National Electoral Commission, or INEC, one of several attacks on the commission's offices ahead of Nigeria's polls in February. INEC officials have said such attacks will not deter the commission from conducting the elections, but political observers say they are already having an impact on the process. Timothy Abiezu reports from Abuja. Imo State Police spokesman Michael Abitam told journalists Monday that officers repelled an early morning assault on an INEC facility in Oweri, the state capital killing three of the attackers and arresting two others. He said the police also recovered firearms, improvised explosive devices and some vehicles. The attackers threw explosives into the facility, destroying part of the building and some vehicles before the officers halted the attack. This was the third attack on INEC facilities in Imo State in the past two weeks, following similar attacks on a facility in nearby Orlu district last week and another one on a local office in Oru West at the start of December. No group has claimed responsibility for the attacks, but authorities have in recent past blamed an outlawed separatist group, the indigenous people of Biafra or IPOB, for increased restiveness in the southeast. IPOB has denied involvement. Paul James is election program coordinator at the Youth Initiative for Advocacy, Growth and Advancement, a non-profit group that monitors elections in Nigeria. He says increasing attacks on electoral body will have consequences. Between 2019 and now, there have been over 53 attacks and uh, the attackers are becoming more daring. We are concerned about how this will impact on citizens' confidence, one. And then even on the part of INEC, we have seen the devastating impact on this in the elections in 2019, that INEC even had to delay elections in some quarters. Imo State is one of the strong bases for the Biafra separatist movement, and attempts by authorities to crack down on separatists have led to an increase in violence there. INEC facilities in Eboyi, Oshun and Ogun states have also been recently targeted and attacked. Why these attacks are increasing is the fact that INEC is insistent on trying to improve the processes of the election. The INEC chair had mentioned that they are going to deploy technology for the election. This is just an attempt to distract INEC. This election is going to be competitive. If these coordinated attacks continue, it will affect their confidence to even engage the process in those states that are affected. INEC spokesman Festus Okoye said in a statement that no critical election materials were destroyed in Monday's attack. The commission on Monday officially started the distribution of permanent voter cards, PVCs, and the process will run through January. However, God bless Otubere, leader of another pro-democracy group, 
the Ready to Lead Africa initiative says the attacks are affecting voter confidence ahead of next year's polls. People are calling us and saying they don't want to go get their PVCs anymore. Uh, they just don't want to die. Our responsibility really is to engage Nigerians on the need to vote and participate. We don't control the security apparatus. I cannot guarantee any Nigerian right now that I can call the military to respond on anything because I'm not in authority. Nigerians go to the polls on February 25th to elect a leader that will succeed Muhammad Buhari, who is exiting after two terms in office. INEC says it will be relying on technology to electronically transmit results and assured Nigerians that the attacks on facilities will not affect the 2023 general polls. Timothy Obiezu for VOA News, Abuja, Nigeria. Guinea's former coup leader, Musa Dadis Kamara, testified for the first time yesterday about his role in a stadium massacre by the military 13 years ago in which at least 157 people were killed and dozens of women raped. Kamara pleaded his innocence, saying he was sleeping during the early hours of the attack, awoken at 11 a.m. when he was told that demonstrators had been killed. Kamara is among 11 men charged in the stadium attack on September 28, 2009, in which security forces fired at unarmed demonstrators protesting the then coup leader's plans to run for president of the West African nation. Kamara had seized power in a coup one year earlier. The trial is expected to last at least until the end of the month. Zambia will start rationing power to consumers for up to six hours daily due to persistent drought and low water levels in the country's main power plant, the Kariba Dam. Analysts say this poses a threat to the country's fragile economy. Katie Short reports from Lusaka, Zambia. Energy Minister Peter Kapala told Parliament that water levels in Lake Kariba have dropped to 4.1% of usable storage for the Kariba North Bank power station in Zambia and the Kariba South Bank on the Zimbabwean side of the reservoir. He said low water levels in Lake Kariba threaten power generation from both hydropower stations. Against this background, there is need to implement measures aimed at rationing the water in the lake in order to avoid a complete shutdown of electricity generation activities at the Kariba complex. However, economist Chenai Mukumba says the electricity deficit is self-inflicted because Zambia did not plan ahead. The situation we're in currently is really unfortunate because a number of years ago, there were already predictions about the fact that we needed to look at how we can diversify our energy supply. I mean, right now, 85% of our electricity is based on, is dependent on hydro. And I think particularly in light of the climate change conversation, there already was a discussion about the urgent need to see how we can, you know, start to look at other sources. You at solar is a resource that we have not been fully uh, capitalizing on. For Esnat Ziwao, a hair salon owner in Lusaka, the power cuts have already started and are having a negative impact on her business. She says she's already experiencing more than four hours of power cuts daily already without notice. It affected a lot because I'm a hairdresser and work with electricity. So there's no electricity. I don't know how am I going to get paid because we work with power. So it affected a lot. Like Ziwao, Gladys Chuka, who runs a butchery in Lusaka, is also affected by long power cuts. We had food gone bad at some time whereby I don't have power 06 until maybe 22 hours and then we are fresh meat we we are supposed to have power every day every time so that we don't uh, have food but last week officials in neighboring zimbabwe which jointly owns the kariba dam with zambia said water levels were too low for them to continue power generation activities there kariba is the main source of electricity for both countries which have experienced persistent drought in recent years energy minister peter kapala says that zambia will import power from the southern africa 
power pool, a cooperative agreement among national electricity companies under the auspices of the Southern Africa Development Community. He says the government is committed to building more infrastructure for energy and also to diversify energy sources. I'm Cathy Short for VOA News in Lusaka, Zambia. In Qatar, fans and players are gearing for the World Cup semifinals. Today, Argentina and Croatia will battle for the first spot in the finals. Morocco fans, however, are unhappy with the difficult process of getting tickets to watch their team in the second semifinal tomorrow. Khalil Fatih was among those trying to get tickets. It's a miserable day. We suffer so much. There is no organization, nothing at all. They let us all the night running from a place to another place. There is no control. People running in front of you, above of you. After that, some people, they come at 5 a.m., 4 a.m., they get the tickets. We come at 10 p.m., and we stay in the queue all the night. I swear to God, all the night, we didn't get nothing. I'm, st- I'm, s- I'm sick already. And I come here for the tickets. Morocco's Atlas Lions are making history as the first team from the African continent and the first team from an Arabic-speaking nation to make the semifinals. They play the 2018 champions France on Wednesday. Catch up on the latest World Cup news on voaafrica.com slash World Cup. And stay tuned to all your favorite VOA programs, including the sunny side of sports. And don't forget to look for our latest 